Right. Okay. So, um, what I want to talk about here is uh, the way whether, whether we can read the application of management theory or bits of management theory in 20th century factories. So, what happens in the 20th century is, is that you get um, a, a body of theory develops, it mainly develops in the United States in the first couple of decades. Um, and you, you might have heard of things like Taylorism and uh, Fordism and things like that, and they come up with these very sort of formulaic ways of managing a business, any business, but often it's factories in the start of the 20th century. Um, and this still continues today, and there's people in business schools in universities all over the country write about this stuff. And some of them take a, um, a historical uh, perspective, uh, and they start thinking about why it's developed where it is to where it is now, but they usually look thinking mainly about modern problems, but they're writing the history of it as well. So that's the, the interdisciplinary thing, and it's whether we can contribute to that as archaeologists looking at buildings. So, um, just to sort of give you a bit of, bit of background to this, so I've said it all sort of started to develop the first couple of decades of the 20th century in the States. It doesn't really get adopted in England until after the First World War, for, for a number of, of reasons that I don't really want to get into. Um, but that's when it starts to begin, and then there's a long, slow British business owners are a bit ambivalent about it, and there's a sort of complicated relationship. But, um, so it's a long, slow process, really, like well into the 1960s, 70s, before it's getting properly done. You get this process by which you move from traditional owner-managed businesses where you're making decisions by rule of thumb and you devolve control of production to foremen who are skilled workers on the factory floor. And that transitions through to um, much more formal, professionalised decision-making that's going on in offices by production engineers. Um, and in theory, if you, if you were a proponent of this kind of idea, it's meant to be um, increasing productivity, so it's increasing wages, so it's good for everybody. But in practice, uh, quite often what, what's happening is it's moving control of production out of the hands of skilled laborers and into offices. So it's about, it's about one of the really big changes in labor relations in this period, and a lot of the concepts uh, are still affecting us now, day, day to day, even, even us, you, you know, universities use, you know, still think in the same way, because you, 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 if you do management, you do it in this way. So, um, what I, the, big, the big trend, really, uh, is, is this thing called scientific management, and that, what that boils down to is you want to optimize your processes physically for efficiency, so you have as people moving around as, as little as possible, they're not wasting time moving and getting materials or tools or whatever, it's all where they need to be, so you're doing, you're being as productive as you can. Uh, and it's also about thinking very carefully about how you divide tasks up amongst your workforce. Uh, and a great deal of this, of course, is physical, and you, you need to um, arrange your factory so that you can produce stuff very efficiently, both, both, both on the factory floor and in the offices. Uh, so I'm going to use a case study. Uh, it's the Team Valley Estate in North East England, just, just on the edge of Gateshead. Uh, and that's what it looks like. Now, um, we did some standing building surveys. Uh, myself and my colleague Kate Armstrong did standing building surveys at these four uh, different factories on the estate. I'm not actually going to talk about K51, I'm just going to do L50, L92, and I60. Uh, today, K51 is quite similar. So, uh, this is from 1960. It's quite an interesting thing in itself because it's set up as a response to the Great Depression. So, uh, the government appointed a commissioner, a uh, commissioner especially at areas of England and Wales. Uh, to try and address the problems that the Great Depression was causing. And one of the things, among, among others, that he did was he uh, persuaded some uh, local industrialists to set up a, um, a company to build a trading state. He then lent money to that company on favourable terms, build factories and let them out to 
businesses, to light industry, so that you're rebalancing the economy away from the, the sort of collapsing um, heavy industries, coal and shipbuilding, things like that. So you, you've got a bit more balance, a bit more, bit more safety. Um, so these, these are brand new factories um, at uh, the time, actually I'm going to talk about that one. Um, and so can we see whether these factories are being built and planned for efficiency, and I think we can. So just to take a very simple example now, um, when we did the surveys of these factories, we don't have, and this is a real problem, we don't have any original plants in any of them. Two of them were empty, and two of them are modern factories, and the plant in them is 1960s at the very oldest. Um, so, but we can say something by looking at positions of the, the sliding sliding doors or, or roller shutters. Originally, sliding doors usually they've been replaced. Um, because they're telling you about where goods are going in and finished products dispatching. So this is L, um, L92, and it's the most straightforward. Uh, you have a sliding door there, one in the factory and one here, and actually on the architect's plan, these amount goods, um, uh, materials in and dispatch here. So that's very simple. You've got materials going in, they go through a number of processes, and then rather than going all the way back to the end factory and out, they're going through the back. So that's very straightforward, but they're obviously Whoever built, uh, the person who designed this factory um, clearly was thinking about efficiency. Uh, now this particular factory, it, it wasn't built for a tenant, it was built as a stock factory, so, or, or a standard factory was the term they used, so that they had some factories, if a tenant turned up one one straight away, they had some just that they could just go into. So the person who's thinking about this is the architect in that particular instance. Uh, now, in practice, what happened at this factory was uh, the tenant that moved in was a chap called Miroslav Sigmund, who was a, a Czech manufacturer of firefighting pumps. And it was during the, it was 1938, he moved into that one. And of course, 1938, the war's approaching, and he gets a lot of big orders, and he needs to expand in 1939 to get big government orders for uh, pumps for fire engines. So he, he asks, for a bespoke factory to be built next to it, and that's L92, sorry, it's L50, is that one, this is L92. Uh, and so this is built to his specification, though, though he needed it quick, so they adapted this plan a little bit. And it's a bit similar, in some senses, um, but, but there are important differences. So, it's still got doors at the other end, it happens to have three, they're still at the opposing ends of the factory, but, um, What's important is that it, this, this door is opposite this. This factory is there already. This gets built a year later. And then we've got these doors down here next to these. Uh, these dotted lines represent a system of gullies. And what they're doing is they're testing. These are for testing pumps because you, you're spraying a lot of water, so you need to drain it out. So I think probably what they've done now is they've switched the way two doors at the end of this factory works. They're taking in goods through what was the taking in materials through what was the dispatch, partially completing them, taking them through there, doing some other processes, probably painting uh, in there, and then moving them into here, testing and then dispatching, and I, I, I guess, it's a guess, probably these are ones that fail testing and head back into L50. So you can see how, even without having the plant here, and we could do much more if we had the original plant, um, we can start to think, we can start to see really very clearly that efficiency is being thought about. You, if, you, if you didn't care about efficiency, you could just have one door. It would be used to heat. Um, I-60 is a bit of a different kettle of fish. <clears throat> uh, I-60 is a very particular type of standard factory on the Team Valley, and the idea of it was that it could be divided into four different units for very small 1,500 square foot units, A to D. And the idea of that was that they would let them out for a pound a week, which is non-economic, it's loss making, uh, on two year leases to people who wanted to set up a new business or wanted to test the northeast area. They'd take it through two years and hopefully after two years they'd be big enough to move into a factory of economic rent. And these only have one door 
per unit. So whatever you do, if, if your product comes in, you've got to move it back to the door to dispatch it. You, you can only do it one way. You can't really make it uh, efficient, at least in the original layout. Um, <clears throat> now, the positions of these doors, they do, they do change as uh, time goes on, and they usually change at um, the time when, when the occupation of the factory changes. So, um, <clears throat> Sigmund pumps move out of um, L50 and L92 in 1949, and um, at, so, at some point, some point before they moved out, they blocked up that door and made a new one here, and that uh, presumably has to do with changes in the layout of the plant, but we don't, there are no records, we don't know. Um, but when they go in 1949, it gets taken over by a cardboard box factory called Alsa, who's their successors actually, Roger and Patrick, and still there. And they were, they were very nice and helpful, and they're just, they're just into survey factories. Um, and they, they, changed, they changed all doors around a little bit. So um, they open up, they take, they take that one first, and then they move into the 60s. And at some point, once they're in both, they move, they open up, they block this door here and this one. They open new ones, one bay down, and they open sort of ordinary swing doors there. And what's going on here, I suspect, is about materials handling. So uh, this is, uh, this, it's, it's what they have it at, set up currently. They have a fence lock here. It, it looks pretty old. It goes along with some lockers, which I'm pretty sure are 1960s types. I think it's that they're introducing forklifts, and this is about safety, it's about having the area where you know forklift drops are going to be, look out for them, and it's about having a <coughs> pedestrian route. And, but we're still doing dispatch the same way, materials in, and then it's going out and out through there. The end. So we can see, we can see how that changes as different, different processes are introduced. Uh, but really even more interesting than uh, the factory floor is what goes on in the offices, because there's a bit more that we can say about them, because they survive a lot better. Um, <coughs> So, um, we can see that these were arranged for um, efficiency, and quite a good example of this is what's going on in uh, L50. So here we have, um, we have general office down here, and this I'm pretty sure has something to do with human resources management, because you've got, you've got a door out here onto to the pay desk, and you've got a door on the factory floor, then you've got another door up into the entrance hall and upstairs to the various other offices on the first floor. And so it's about, it's about giving easy and very efficient access to the places that the people in that office were going to need to be. Um, it's a little less, um, less obvious upstairs, you've simply got the offices along, arranged along a corridor. Um, again, remember this was, a, this was a, a standard factory, so there was a certain amount of flexibility needed to be built in, because you didn't know who was going to go into it. <coughs> So, um, a little bit different in L92 uh, next door because this was built uh, bespoke. Uh, you've got similar setup here, they haven't bothered with a, a pay desk, but they do still have doors in the same place in the general office. Upstairs, though, they were. Oh, Yes, okay. So um, they were able to do things a bit differently here. So, for example, you have, because they knew that the company that was going in would need a general manager's office, they were able to do that and give particular access to the, to the secretary rather than having to come out through the corridor. And then you have it. the general office. And the general office, <coughs> I suspect, it's a female secretarial staff, so it's nearby the women's restroom and lavatory. So, um, <clears throat> let's get through that minute. Keep that. Um, so we can see we can see some efficiency probably being thought about in the offices, but it's not. That's not sort of all that's going on here because we can also start to pick out how this maps on to ideas of status and hierarchy within the firms. So um, the most there's, there's sort of three three things that are that are key here, and the most obvious one 
is about who uses which entrance. So we've got here in, in L50, we've got very specifically a worker's entrance, <clears throat> and you go in and you go past the time clock and you clock in, and then when you come out, you go past the time clock again, and the, the pay desk is presumably on in the Saturday afternoon, you can come back. Um, <clears throat> And then, but if you're if you're a manager or if you're the clerical staff, you're going through the entrance hall, and that gives you access to the stairs in your offices or into the the general office if that's where you work. Um, and you can see similar uh, similar similar sorts of things here. Although we don't have the desk in L92, there is still a separate workers' entrance and. The, the main entrance is architecturally elaborate. They're, they're more fancy. They've got the little bits of it. It's quite strange because it's modernism, but it's, uh, it is more fancy. But it, it, that partly because that's where you take visitors as well. <clears throat> and um, the, other, the other sort of issue with, with, with status, the other thing that you pick out is different floor treatments. So um, any places that the workers go, uh, so the, the the workers' lavatories and the 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 entrance for the workers it's a granite thick screen floor. It's concrete, whereas the offices have upstairs obviously have floor walls because that's you couldn't do it any other way. But the 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 office and the reception and bits of the entrance hall it's a parquet floor, so you get you get a different. And and whilst that's a practical thing, it, it is sort of it's it's bound to be reinforcing. Um, <laughs> You know, where, where you are in the floor, uh, in, in, in the firm, it's, it's reinforcing the tables. And then the sort of final final aspect about, about status is who's getting surveyed by whom. So you've got a lot, you know, you've got this general office, they can, they can easily poke their head out and say, or you can get back to work. Um, <clears throat> and that kind of thing, and you, there are um, other, um, Um, so, you know, there, there are other, um, I don't know why those slides are there. Um, but this is all quite, um, quite different, again, in the very much smaller firms. Um, firms, presumably, that are, that are supposed to be, um, that probably aren't thinking about um, this, you know, management in quite such a, a careful way. So in, in, in the I-60 offices, um, <clears throat> you only have you only have the one set of laboratories, so you can't have laboratory, different laboratories with different um, stages of the firm, you only have the one entrance, everyone has to go in that way. Um, in these three units, although actually in B, you pay half a crown extra to get this, and you get a couple of offices at the expense of some factory floor space, but that means you can have a workers' entrance and a main entrance, and you also get, the way they've set it up in this factory anyway, you had a window so you could um, pay attention to what's going on the factory floor. So you can see sort of an attempt to some extent in there, but it's also, it's not to the same extent <coughs> as in the factory. Now, um, the, the, in practice, um, this division between different status people in the firm is one between different genders because the um, gender division of labour is extremely um, heavily policed in the 1930s. Um, it's um, more, more, more than you would think. Um, so <clears throat> we take this L50 is a really good example because it's built for signal pumps, all male workforce, light, light, um, light industry. So you only have men's restrooms, male laboratory on the ground floor, um, whereas when you go upstairs you have um, what I think probably you've got an all-female clerical staff with their facilities there and then the managerial staff presumably are expected to be male and they have, so you've got as you might think of a um, Almost the way you might think of gendered spaces within a oh, prehistoric house or something, you can almost sort of map it onto this. And I think this probably does build into moral concerns. I think that it was relatively novel to have very mixed workforces, and I think that I think it does build onto that there are there are 
um, mid 20th century films where you can see um, this sort of worry about that sort of thing. So um, that's that's very quick. So only a few examples. There's tons more examples of this in my research, and I've got a paper hopefully coming out late next year um, that goes into this in much more detail. But I think we can pick this stuff out. Um, um, we can think about how it was being done or how it wasn't in the case of the IEC factory being done in some cases. Um, and we can start to contribute to that discussion um, and contribute to ideas about how firms manage and why they're done in the way they are and um, come up with the next big management firm become millionaires, hopefully. So anyway, that's, that's that.